Hi, good evening. Welcome to the second uh, lecture, evening lecture of the Fall Lecture Series at uh, the School of Architecture. Uh, I just want to make a quick early announcement, uh, which is this Wednesday at 1. The Wednesday episode is Ed Mitchell and Fred Coder, both from Yale University. Uh, Ed is an architect and author and wrote their Almost Gone, among other things, which is an essay on the 72 Munich Olympics and architecture and design. So for all of you dealing with the Olympics. And Fred Coder is co-author of Collage City. And a week from today, here will be Jeff Kipnis from Ohio State University. Tonight I'm pleased to welcome Ross Weimer to the School of Architecture. Uh, Ross is currently a design partner at SOM, where he's practiced for the last 12 years. Uh, after leaving the New York office three years ago to head up a studio here. Um, as an adjunct professor at IIT, uh, Ross has received his bachelor's degree from Yale, his master's from Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design, and as I learned not so long ago, went to a rival high school in New Jersey, uh, although we never met on the field, uh, thankfully. Um, both in New York and Chicago, Ross has um, elevated the visibility of design and design excellence at SOM and is a significant force in the renaissance of that firm. He's worked for several PA awards, uh, has been exhibited and published widely. Uh, in fact, Ross himself has been uh, published widely and largely. As you will know, he was the first uh, um, major headshot on Architect magazine a year ago. Uh, two weeks ago, when Stanley Teichman was here, I said that the lecture series spanned four generations and three continents, with Stanley being one of those generations, and Tom Main, who you'll see in November, being a second. But really, most of the lecturers, I would say, are in, in one group uh, in their 40s, like Ross, which is, unfortunately for all of you, still very young as an architect. Um, uh, and I think it's interesting to look at that group and actually see the different trajectories for professional practice and how you can advance experimental pro project through different uh, ways to proceed through the profession. So, on the European side, uh, the lessons seem to be that you start a, a firm early with your friends from school uh, and with a kind of generous subsidy from the government and professional enabling uh, can actually uh, develop a, an office relatively early, uh, as with Camille Klasa and NL Architects or you uh, win a major international competition early uh, that propels you and your office into a kind of international scene and immediately inundates you with large numbers of people in your office like Alejandro Zarapola and FOA. Uh, in the States, uh, unfortunately for all of us, uh, the options are uh, both more extreme and maybe in some ways uh, a little bit more difficult. Um, you can uh, more or less stick to the academic side and develop a small practice, develop an interesting work, and with talent and luck, uh, try to achieve a larger audience, but still probably typically remain a fairly small practice, as the case with uh, Andy Zaga, who will be here at the end of, uh, the end of October. Or uh, you can uh, work up the corporate ladder and also with talent and luck, hopefully have your voice and your signature emerge as the head of a studio uh, in that large office as Ross has done. The lesson being that it's much harder than the U.S. to flourish, so you have to make a kind of Faustian bargain either with the academy uh, or the corporate office. Fortunately for us and for SOM, Ross's bargain has succeeded incredibly well uh, with design work that spans from uh, master plans to door handles, uh, from airports to museums, uh, and towers that range from Chicago and New York uh, to Asia and the Middle East. Uh, so Ross is a very important uh, architect and voice for our, my generation, um, and both here and globally. John Cage once said, um, I think, actually I don't know if it's John Cage, I'm just making that part up, but somebody once said, um, I only work with friends or people who can become friends. And I have the same feeling about the lecture series. Uh, so please join me in welcoming, uh, hopefully, a new friend of UIC, and someone we'll see back a lot frequently, Ross Weimer. Thanks, thanks Bob. I'm going to tip this thing up. I, I want to change this out, actually, because this was a slideshow, an alternate version. 
version of uh, the universe, and I, I want to do the one I had in the end of the year. So it's some sort of tech issue with Macintosh, I guess. It's no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I actually, when you see the first slide, you may understand why it's not wanting to play. It's being an SMM computer. So I, I was uh, I was trying to figure out what to, what to title it. Well, this this is why I think it's title. And it's the right orientation on the slide for what I want to talk about. And I think one of the biggest questions that a lot of people have is, well, what is SLM? What are you trying to do? What is the future of SLM? How do you try to track the trajectory of this firm that's been in existence for over 70 years? And you know, we've got over a thousand people worldwide. And I was looking to try to figure out how to explain that. Uh, to you guys who might be asking that same question, and uh, to try to you know, try to clarify what our objectives are you know, as a design group. Because uh, you know, if you're Frank Gehry, if you're Daniel Liebeskin, it's quite clear what you what you do. And when a client comes to you, you know, a client comes to Frank, they, they want Kirby stuff. He's going to give them Kirby stuff, and it's, there's great clarity to that. Now there was great clarity to what SLM used to do which was sort of to, to, to follow through on this Miesian paradigm and do it in an elegant way. You know, the question becomes, what do you do now once, that, once you've gone beyond that? How do, you, how do you try to do architecture today? Uh, so I'm going to show a couple of slides. This is, well, this is the way we used to work. Not me, but that SOM. So a bunch of guys, white shirts, you know, tie. And uh, we've reconfigured our office so that we work in a collaborative way now around the table with a diverse group of people. And it's a very different way of, of uh, creating architecture than it was in the past, which was a sort of military machine where you shall draw these lines uh, and get them done on time. Uh, and so these are, so basically what I want to show is a bunch of exper experiments. And some of these were successful and some of them weren't. Uh, but the idea is how do you, how do you invert the norm? How do you Take, take for granted, and what you, people take for granted that you do well, how do you start to reinterpret it? So this was a design for New York City Streetlight, and that was a competition we did a couple of years ago. We ended up being the semi-finalist behind uh, Tom Pfeiffer, and this is now actually in New York City's repertoire of, uh, of traffic lights. Um, uh, but Tom Pfeiffer's uh, won the competition. So the idea here was, can you do, can you create a streetlight that performs differently in the city. We wanted a continuous form that would allow you to define the shape of the street, start to capture space, but also take care of this clutter that you usually find attached to the side of the street light. And eventually, over time, incorporate all these components uh, within the shape of the tube itself. So signs, uh, don't walk sign, the, 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 the luminaire of the, tra the traffic light all fits within the profile of the tube, so you have a neat piece of infrastructure in the city. It's perfectly uh, capable of accommodating all this because all of this technology is LED now. And uh, the stuff that you see as you walk down the street strapped on, those on the sides of street lights was designed for sort of an analog world and, and these are all incandescent fixtures that require a bigger house. But you can do this today. Uh, and you can see the profile. This is just a steel tube uh, flattened out that accommodates the luminaire, which is in the top accommodates a pedestrian-oriented fixture that faces the sidewalk and can't even incorporate technology uh, like small LED screen that you could access through the internet to advertise your garage band. You could, you could say, you could, you could look for your lost cat. Uh, but there's great ways that this, you know, this traffic light where you can, instead of stapling up that band poster on the side, you could access this thing and it could be a, a, a piece of digital technology that communicates and allows you to, to brand the whole neighborhood Street. Uh, we also found that this shape would allow you to accommodate photovoltaic uh, array up on, the, up on the top. It's about eight square feet, which is enough to drive all of the LED components, not the main luminaire. If the main luminaire is LED, and then this thing works, and, and the street light can be completely off the grid. You don't even have to, you don't have to plug it. Uh, so we built the full-size mock-up. This is for the judging of, of the competition. And then, actually, in collaboration with the manufacturer that we worked with on the competition, uh, they built the mock-up in their own uh, in their own factory, and it's, so it's pieces. It's a piece
piece of steel tube that's very durable, easy to manufacture, and uh, we're looking for other locations for, for the scuba to be used. And that's a, a little bit what it looks like. So one of the things we're trying to do is get some of the light to leak out along the surface of the um, of the street light so you can get an arc of light, a series of arcs of light uh, that define the street as you move down. Uh, next experiment was, well, is there a way to, to reinterpret or rethink uh, cultural institutions like museums and how might you do that? This is the sketch of a museum it's in New York, small space, about 5,000 square feet, it's in the Manhattan. And we did this for Carol Willis, uh, educator, somebody who's just fascinated with the idea of the skyscraper. Tiny space, the question was, well, how do you, how do you convey this idea of skyscraper? It's a vertical thing in a, in a fairly short space that's, that's limited in dimension. Uh, so we, we polished, we created the floor and ceiling out of polished stainless steel, and uh, we designed a series of uh, vitrines that fit in the space. Which, uh, which, uh, vitrines that fit in the space that house these artifacts that are reflected infinitely in the stainless steel. So at least when you, when you walk into this museum, you get this sense of verticality. Uh, and what's funny is if you go with uh, little kids, they'll drop down on all fours uh, because you get this feeling of vertigo kind of floating in between these, uh, these polished points. So that was one investigation in the idea of uh, institution. Actually, uh, this slide's in here. This is what it looks like on the streets. Fairly uh, normative building. It's in Battery Park City. Uh, it, it adheres to the standards of Battery, Battery Park City, which were established by uh, uh, Cooper and then executed for the most part by people like Cesar Pelli. Uh, what we proposed and, and uh, our client is trying to get uh, funding for is a new vestibule that steps out into the street. Uh, but we've designed this with James Durrell, a light artist, so that rather than having a physical vestibule, it actually is a vestibule that's, that's comprised of light. So it's, it's sort of a box of light that sits on the street. Uh, we've got a full size mock or a part, partial size mock up that, that's, that's fully functional on it. Uh, they're just trying to raise about half a million dollars to build. Uh, this is a, just a quick study of a, of a competition we did from the Mill Center for the Arts, Carolina. The idea here was uh, to take a vernacular structures and get them uh, to be the components of this facility. And each of these components were, were meant to be sort of an elemental representation of uh, what you find in the vernacular of this, of this part of the country. There's a stone building, and a brick building, a metal building, and a wood building. All sort of working together to form a courtyard where performances can take place. These buildings also opened up into the courtyard, so it's a building a complex that works sort of inside out. But the pieces included a museum, artist workshops, uh, and performing, two performing arts halls. Uh, and this was an idea of how you could actually string a series of cables as kind of a canopy over the space that you could, so that you could create some cover in the event of rain, and and you could suspend the speakers uh, a la, uh, a la uh, which we call it the bench of Pittsburgh Pavilion. Uh, you could put speakers out in space to, to fine tune the, uh, the sound of the space. Uh, you see the elevations. You get a sense of what this composition of buildings is like, and the space in the middle. Another sort of an experiment. This is, a, this is for a, a children's museum and science museum in Goa. Um, an ambitious program of about 25 museums because they want to make Doha into a, a tourist destination. Uh, this one's pretty far down the list, so we're not quite sure when, when this thing might, uh, might get built. But the idea of this museum uh, was to take standard program, which is usually sort of strewn out along the ground in a black box, uh, and stack it up vertically so you can, uh, so you can explore these programs uh, in a vertical way rather than horizontally. And we used as an armature to, uh, to string these programs uh, the idea of a, a, so a solar uh, power generator. The way this works is it's sort of a skirt of glass that sits down in the grave. The air heats up underneath this skirt and starts to rise up the tube, driving a wind turbine at the top. So we thought that by using this as the armature for the building, you could go there and you could see science in action. It wouldn't just be a, a bunch of canned exhibits. Uh, you'd really be able to see a, a working piece of technology. Uh, so we have a diagram structure that supports it. 
there's a course that serves the whole building, and then you know, this glass sleeve uh, that goes over the tube and the glass uh, skirt down at the grade level, and then uh, a series of programs that are stacked up, these cylinders that sit within the tube uh, that, that hold the exhibits. So, and this is the way it would look on the skyline. They were also looking for a way to, uh, to sort of state their presence on the skyline of Doha. <coughs> And they were pretty intrigued by this possibility. Uh, another museum project. Um, this this one is in Beijing. It was a competition for a building in Beijing, right near uh, all of the Olympic uh, the Olympic elements. It's the sort of yellow building that we're closing in, in the top left or the top right corner. And here we started studying uh, this. Once again, they wanted a black box. They just wanted a black box. They wanted somebody to decorate it up the outside. They had a pretty good idea of what they wanted in terms of the program, but they were indifferent to the architectural quality of it. They just wanted a polite exterior. Uh, we started taking a look at a container that held these program elements, uh, a little like the, uh, the, the a little like the diagrid structure of the tower, but in this case, we were trying to show uh, the structural logic of, of the container. So we did a loading diagram based on uh, uh, a structural engineering program uh, that yielded this pattern, which is somewhat similar to some of these patterns you see down below uh, of, uh, of, of patterns that are generated by the stresses in a flat plate. Uh, so that gave us sort of the pattern for the box. This way when you go to the museum, you understand how the structural loads are brought down and, it's, uh, and the box starts to speak of its technology. These are the programs, the way they would stack up, and this is an idea of what the image would, would be on the exterior. So rather than, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's near the Tokyo Demeron Stadium, which is, is this beloved bird nest that has a, a fabulously expressive structure, uh, but it's not really derived from a structural diagram. Uh, I think our idea was that you take the structural diagram and some idea of what the material should be like. view from above where you could actually reveal the, uh, the logic of the programs or the, the programs through this screen. And the next set of experiments are about uh, office buildings and high-rise buildings, which is something where uh, the office is known for, something we do well, something where actually it's more difficult to innovate. You know, our clients are, are looking you know, they know exactly what they want, and they're looking for something quick and economical, and they're looking for about sort of 1.1% innovation in there uh, that's going to allow them some competitive advantage over their, uh, over their rivals, but they're not looking for something that's necessarily that for, for the most part. And so, so here are some experiments along those lines. I thought Paul would enjoy this. It's a product uh, that uh, Paul and I worked on um, for a building for China Energy, which is an energy company. They, they wanted their corporate headquarters in these long row buildings in Beijing where all the, all the big uh, corporations had their headquarters. And we, we sort of set out to, to make the whole complex convey the idea of energy. We were trying to, trying to see well, how, what are the, the many ways the building can express the energy that's in it. And one of the ways is, uh, is sort of the, the energy that's in the structure. So this is sort of a diagram of the facade that we, uh, that our structural engineers would subject to loads to see what the pattern would be in terms of loading of it. So it's another uh, version of the diagram. And then some early studies where, you know, it, as soon as you look at it, you, you can see how the building feels like energy. Now, then we did these for the mid-review and then you know, just confused the client. To know <laughs> and so we simplified some other diagrams in this sort of structural component uh, that would form the building uh, and the facade. This would be the facade on that sort of main drag in, in Beijing. Uh, so we, we try to take the same concept but to simplify, uh, simplify the way it would be built. So here you see the loading diagram and the, the diagram of the structure. So this is actually the structure of the building, it's more dense. 
down, down at the lower level, less dense up above. So we're still trying to convey this idea of energy. Energy in the ground plane where we're envisioning a kind of a, a garden of uh, alternative energy. And this garden actually came out to form the elevator cores and this sort of spectacular public space at the center of the project. And this, is, this is a sort of diagram of view, but you get the idea that the building, as soon as you walk in the door, feels like it's about energy. This is the view along uh, the main street that Chang'an might be in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, I think the client was still confused, actually, after <laughs> this one. Uh, they were looking for some kind of sort of slick, uh, slick American glass building. But that experiment uh, made us still keep trying to develop this idea of energy in the facade and this, this idea that you, you, you could express this structure in, in, in a unique way in the facade. This is an office tower in Doha. You get a sense of, of what the uh, conditions are like there in this desert climate, but it's right on the Gulf. Section of the building, it's all office, uh, with some public functions down at grade. Fairly straightforward stacking section. Uh, what we're trying to do in the facade, once again, is this, this conveys sort of the change in energy uh, as, as you look across the, uh, across the facade. Uh, with columns get lower at the, you know, down at the lower level uh, and it's spaced further apart and more dense but uh, finer grain texture at the top of the tower. And uh, so, what we looked at in, in terms of the plan is is a way to make this office building work better in a desert climate. Typically, in, a, in an office building, in a climate like in Doha, uh, you, you get a very bright spot of sun right adjacent to the window, so it's very uncomfortable. So if you go visit an office that's in a conventional sort of steel and glass building right now in the Gulf, you find that all the furniture is pulled away, away from the window uh, because it's uncomfortable to be by the window. And, and, and all of the interior lighting is pumped up back away from the window because you have this strong contrast. You get this really bright spot on the floor and you've got to compensate with more artificial light further into the floor. Uh, so we thought, well, the way to solve that would be to put a sunshade at the window so you're, you create a spot of shade instead of bright sunlight by the window. And if you position this sunshade down below the ceiling, it works as a light shelf and it bounces daylight deeper into the floor plate. So what you see in plan here, uh, the exterior envelope is defined by, well, the glass envelope is the smaller interior circle, the structure, and the edge of this light shelf is this, is this outside uh, shape, uh, which is slightly eccentric because you don't need the sunshade in the north, uh, you need a slightly deeper uh, version of the sunshade on the eastern ones. Uh, so here you see the section so the light shelf is bouncing daylight deep within the space and creating an area of shadow. So you've got more functional floor plate to work with, and you've got better quality of light and less artificial light within the floor. So you can have some <coughs> savings on your mechanical plant and better quality of light. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of rendering what it would be like sitting inside the space with this light shelf above. Uh, this particular building is located right on the wall, so there are uh, spectacular views now. Uh, which were unencumbered by dark tinted glass or, uh, or, or sunshades, so you actually get to take advantage of the uh, So here's another project. Uh, likewise, it's kind of an experiment, and this is under construction now in Dubai. Very similar kind of site as, as this uh, row of tower. This one is all residential. It gives you a sense of what the site is like. It overlooks uh, one of the Palm Islands, it's on this uh, Dubai Marina. <clears throat> Instant city, still growing, boy, it's, it, this is a, a, a number of years old, so there's actually a, a lot more construction there now than there was at this time. Uh, and, and we came up with an idea that a building that would twist. And the idea that the, behind this building is that the, the views, views are best towards the uh, marina down low and towards the gulf up high in the building. So by twisting the floor plate, you get more of the rooms have take advantage of the best views. Uh, the client loved this idea when, when we uh, competed for the 
project, so, uh, so we continue with this. But these diagrams are actually uh, were done by our uh, structural engineering group as a way of testing the degree of twist to the building. And we were able to create a parametric model for the building that you can test uh, against a, a structural engineering uh, software that lets you know how much concrete you're going to have to use to, to support the building and measure whether there was an optimum degree of twist. And as it turned out, what we really found was that there wasn't a premium for a degree of twist that went between, say, 75 degrees and 90 degrees. So we stayed with 90 degrees, which was what we thought worked best on the site. And you did get a significant savings for less, less twist in the tower, uh, but it was, the building didn't feel quite as dynamic at this, at this height. So here you, you see a, a view of the, the par parametric model, just the skeleton of it. And I'm sorry, this just looks a little washed out. Uh, but you get, just to give you an idea of how the plan works, in order to get a twisted tower to work, if you've got a rectilinear core, you end up having to have a different design for each floor. Uh, as, the, as the floor sort of rotates around the core. You create a cylindrical core, so you can imagine these floor plates pivoting around that cylinder, so all of the, so you can have repeated floors. So the key for a residential, uh, residential plan is to make sure the floors are, are, uh, are floors that you can, you can build an identic, identical plate, so we actually have, all the floors are the same, they're just rotating one degree at each level. Uh, this is a model. So we built this model, which is about three or four feet tall. And so we could explain to the contractor how, how it would be built. And it's an important part of the process, actually, because it's very difficult to visualize with a set of straightforward documents like plans and sections, how you're supposed to build uh, something like this. But when the contractor saw that each floor is exactly the same, it's just, a sh it's just shifting one degree, yet they yeah, they were able to build this at only a small premium over what a standard building. And you get a sense of, I mean, there's a section, and it, you get this very peculiar shape when you slice through it, even though the plan is fairly straightforward. And as far as the skin goes, what we were trying to do is something a little bit similar to the DOA project, but rather than you know, create this glass obelisk out in the desert, we are trying to protect the glass with the, uh, with the structure and with a series of screens that buffer the daylight. So you see here the screens and glass set back. And you get a sense of what it might be like inside the space uh, looking through these screens. Uh, so there are a few views of the, uh, of the shape as it's in this thing. Night and day. Uh, and this thing should be coming up out of the ground shortly. Uh, they're still, they're still uh, doing piling work and so on. This is a project that's built, uh, and it's not really so much an, an experiment, but the result of some experiments we, uh, we conducted on, on other projects in Singapore. But uh, one of the things that's interesting about this building. Uh, is that there are public spaces up in the section of the tower, and you can see the, the, the landscaping on them. Uh, and you're, you're, you're able in Singapore to, uh, to build these roof gardens without giving up floor area, uh, which is extremely valuable. Uh, but you don't, you don't have to give up the, sort of the FAR for the floor uh, if you make them publicly accessible. So the public can access these roof gardens as well as uh, people in the building, and it's proven to be extremely popular because people use them to go have a smoke. Smoking is still very popular in Singapore, and uh, it saves, saves you a lot of time from having to go all the way down uh, to the lobby level to go out and have a smoke and step out on these roof terraces. The terraces give you these great views out to the sea. Uh, this is a concept model where we were exploring the, the pattern of the uh, openings how these roof terraces might actually work. And then also this idea of a sort of a scrim of louvers that clad the whole building to keep them from using dark tinted glass or mirrored glass, which is more typical in, uh, in Singapore, and still have uh, great views out. Uh, and then these are views of the building. So if nothing else, we can get a test of what our, 
renderings were revealing what uh, in fact we were going to get. Uh, and so that's a view of the building, some view of the screen. There's a, there's a there's parking garage in the base, so this screen of louvers disguises the parking lot garage and allows the whole building to be this one. So, so those, those were some experiments relating that building type. Is there a way to innovate? Is there a way to change? the way high-rise buildings are looking uh, by virtue of the technology that's incorporated in them and the way they respond to their climate. I'm sure you can't tell what this is, but it's some interior of an airport. But one thought was yeah, the airport as a building type, you know, is that something that, that you can innovate? So you, need a, you need a great hall, you need to put all this detail in it, you have a very specific Technical requirement uh, you know, for how this how this thing functions. Uh, and this was uh, to the airport uh, terminal three that's in Singapore. Uh, this project uh, is, is now almost complete. They're about to open it, uh, but the, the roof itself is about the size of six football fields. It's an enormous roof that covers all the passenger processing areas of the terminal. And uh, we started this exercise after having done uh, the rail connection um, from the subway system, they asked us to look at this third terminal, which completes the master plan of the airport. And we thought it would be good to make this building respond to the climate of Singapore. And Singapore happens to sit right on the equator. So uh, there's a very steady resource of sun. Sunrise is about 7 o'clock every morning, sets at about 7 o'clock every evening. Some people say, well, isn't that boring? But from the standpoint of, of how you make a building work, uh, when you're trying to use the energy of the sun, it's, it's a really positive thing. It gives you a consistent resource. Uh, we also were thinking, how do you, instead of just making an expressive structure that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's essentially like a big train shed or, or just an interpretation of uh, the plants, train sheds, which most of the great airports are, could, could you make it simply a field? Kind of the roof just be a field? And this was a field of louvers that we generated a program just for a random array. We were experimenting with this random array of louvers. And could you make a roof that was just sort of a cloud? So we built a model of this and convinced the client that that would be pretty interesting to do. And this is a large model made of stainless steel and the Ministry of Transportation said, well, has anybody ever done this before? And we said no. And instead of saying, well, absolutely not, they said, well, that's great. That's exactly what we want. And, uh, the next step was to, to create a sort of technical uh, technical understanding, understanding how this thing works. We worked with uh, Dieter Barbenbach, the Barbenbach, uh, based in, in Austria, to engineer a series of skylights that would allow us to uh, use only natural daylight throughout the whole day, without artificial light. Uh, so that demanded a, a bunch of very carefully engineered skylight openings, uh, and they actually they have uh, louvers above them and below them. So on the next slide. Uh, but part of part of the story was also in Singapore, in Terminal Two right now they have one skylight and it leaks. Uh, if you've ever been to Singapore before, you, you know that it rains in buckets. It's Quite common, an enormous amount of rain at once. So they've always had problems with the skylight leaking. We were proposing 2,000 skylights, so they, they, uh, they said, well, we don't want any of these things to leak. Uh, and we came up with an idea that was a little bit like the exterior wall of the building. So you build the roof instead of like conventional skylights, you build it more like a layer of the, the exterior of the building, so you can very carefully control uh, how these things are made. Uh, I'm hoping they don't. Get a call. I haven't got any calls yet. Uh, so here's a section through the skylight. It has a sort of bell-shaped profile that drives more daylight down to the floor uh, of the terminal. A series of fixed louvers actually down below the skylight and operable louvers on top. This is what the array looks like. We actually worked great, a great deal on this array uh, because we're trying to create a pattern that didn't repeat. We like that sort of wallpaper pattern. If you've too tight a configuration, you notice that this pattern is repeating. In this case, we're trying to, to run it across uh, this 
area of six football fields, and it took a fair amount of fine tuning to get that right. Uh, we tested this in, in renderings and so on, until we got a sense of you know, what this was feeling right in terms of the density of the bloopers as well. Uh, and we built a, a large scale model of this was at the Venice Biennale out of the actual materials that sustain the steel. And we, fig we figured we had it just about right. We tested it in an artificial sky, which Bartenbach has in their library, or in their, uh, in their laboratory in Innsbruck. Uh, the idea of this artificial sky is that you can imitate uh, the condition of the sky anywhere in the world at any time of day. And we were able to demonstrate that this uh, array of skylights was going to give them the performance they were looking for in the whole terminal. Full-size mock-up, so they were the clients a little bit nervous with this was going to have the right visual effects. So they built a full-size mock-up of one bay and then mirrored all four faces. So when you stood in the space, it's sort of infinitely. And they were uh, sufficiently pleased with the effect that they well, they went ahead and built it. Uh, and this was actually a mock-up of, of the butterfly louvers that are on the roof. And you see here on a, on a cloudy day, they, they, they go straight up. On a, on a bright sunny day, uh, they, they fold down. So if you've got you know, a mix of sun and clouds, you've got something a little in between, and they fold flat uh, at night and a bright sunny day. So the buffers take out of light that's coming through. Here's under construction, you can see the trusses uh, that are visible. They, we didn't cover them up with a soffit, but we tried to get those elements to be as clean as they could be so they didn't compete with pattern louvers. This is once again under construction. A little warehouse like, and uh, these images are just from last week. Uh, so you can see the, the louvers that are in, uh, the skylights are in, it looks a lot like the rendering. Uh, we weren't responsible for any of this interior stuff, it was done by other architects who were focusing on the roof, uh, a sense of what the effect is like. And a couple of the unique spaces in the terminal, well, this is a, a view once again looking up at the soffit. Some skylights and rivers. This field we were trying to create. And here's one of the unique spaces inside the terminal. So we're trying to, one of the great features of, of uh, this airport in Singapore uh, is the garden. When you arrive in the airport here in the garden, it's just a beautiful, lush garden. Uh, it's the signature of the airport, more so the terminal buildings themselves. We we're trying to bring this landscape into the terminal and also. Uh, make your experience coming into the country yeah, as, as interesting as it is leaving. It's typical when you arrive in a country, you go pick up your bags, you're in a space that's about 10 feet tall, and uh, you know, you're, you know, you're exhausted from the flight, you're wondering if your bag is going you know, you have to wait, wait for a fairly, fairly long period of time while your bag comes out. So right here are where the baggage carousels are. So we, we push the floor back so that this whole space is open to the skylight. Uh, which is sort of green wall that sits behind it, and within the claim devices is actually a small garden, so there's landscaping uh, where you pick up the bags. The bag belts are right in front of here. You can see another view of it. So we actually altered the skylights. They brought, uh, they brought more daylight into this, into this part of the terminal, so all of the landscaping will grow properly. Uh, so this next set of experiments, uh, has to do with, with the city, and uh, this is the last chapter of this, uh, this idea of, of, of experimenting. And uh, there are a couple of proposals where we have the opportunity to work you know, on, on a very large scale, and it almost demands a different response, a different sort of way of looking at these challenges. Uh, and what I'm going to show is, the, is our um, design competition proposal for the World Trade Center site. Um, before I came to Chicago, I was working on this sort of one, there, there are many phases of our involvement there that include a Freedom Tower that's, that's under construction now, but what I wanted to talk about was actually the, our design competition entry that we did uh, in conjunction with a group of, uh, of other architects and artists. Uh, so it was truly a collaborative idea about you know, what, is, what is the future city going to look like really high density chunk of the city. Uh, so we started by looking at the site in downtown Manhattan. It's one of the densest cities on earth. Uh, and you can see there the, the, 
Trade Center site is, the sort of gap in this in unbelievably dense uh, piece of city fabric. And we started investigating different uh, different aspects of how this site uh, is affected by those things that are around it and, and, uh, and things like history. Uh, so one of the first things we started looking at were old maps. And what's really interesting actually about the Trade Center site is that in 1767, half of that site was, was actually in the river. Uh, and as the city grew and as waste was dumped in the river, forming landfill, the city really expanded out. Uh, so only only half of that site is pretty dry land uh, as it stands now. So you can see look at a series of maps, the site crept out uh, towards the river. You can see these layers in this diagram here. And uh, so this was what it looked, it looked like at one point when it actually was stitched together by city streets. And that's that street grid. So I'm looking at the site uh, right after the disaster. You know, one of the ideas was to do, do you pull pieces of the street grid back that allow this piece of the site to be knitted in with the, the uh, rest of the neighborhood. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, that street that cuts the site uh, down the middle of which is Green Street uh, was actually at one point the, uh, the edge of the island. In addition, this is way too complicated to describe, uh, but the, the reality of what's underneath the site, right within the, the footprint of the site of the Trade Center, is a very complex network of, uh, of commuter rail and uh, subway lines that make it actually really valuable as a piece of real estate because it's so well served by public transportation. That's one of the things that's, that's often overlooked. And everybody knows the design of the Calatrava's station, uh, but that station actually is, is really only the entrance. The, the station itself is about seven stories below the grade. So one of the first things we tried to tackle as, as a group as we were collaborating on this project was the idea of the memorial. Um, and our thought was, well, let's take a piece of the site that actually is at grade today and make it the memorial. Because uh, one of the problems, that, as, as everyone knows, is that there's no real memorial on the site now uh, since there's this huge void uh, cut into the ground. And, uh, there actually is a piece of the site that's on the, uh, on the northernmost edge that's, that is at grade. And you could, you could uh, create a memorial there uh, that could be expanded later. But the thought was to create a place that people could go right now. Uh, and interestingly enough, this sort of slice of the site corresponds well uh, to the churchyard. Uh, you can see that here in the plan. And it still allows the whole site to be developed however so many might want. Uh, we thought that might be an interesting proposition. Uh, so as you look east here from uh, Battery Park City, uh, you see how this memorial might correspond to, uh, to this, this great churchyard that sits down. And ultimately, once the site got developed with a number of buildings, the proposal was to restate the ground plane in the air so your memorial might actually be at the 80th story of these, of these uh, towers uh, so you could go experience a memorial in the sky. Our thoughts about the, the rail station was that we just wanted to kind of a way to stitch together all of these, all of these elements of transportation uh, and link them to the sky. And this is something that, that uh, Carla Travis proposal uh, does quite well. Uh, in our case, we were suggesting that this might actually run all the way across the site. Uh, but you can see here the relationship between what is the space of the station and, in fact, where you arrive. So this sort of glowing square in the, in the middle is really set about seven stories down. So you need to move upwards from there into this, into this main space. And our thought was that Link the space to the sky and allow people to get out to the street in a logical way, you overcome some of the problems of, of actually arriving underground at the station. Uh, so we started to look at the towers and see whether there was a new way of looking at towers. One of the first thoughts was that uh, in doing this uh, sort of an MRI of Manhattan, just taking these slices of the city as you go up, a very interesting series of layers correspond actually to elevator technology. So the city of the, particularly lower Manhattan is defined by a series of fairly well-defined layers 
where you know, somebody, somebody figured out how to get the elevator to, to, to go up a little higher and you, you got another strat. So it actually corresponds to the age of the buildings and where this elevator technology was. And so we thought that if we created uh, a sky garden to correspond to those levels, it would give uh, the, would sort of lock these buildings into the logic of the city, uh, at, least, uh, at least downtown. Midtown is a different combination of buildings and a lot of Sort of different mix, but downtown happens to have this strata. The other idea was uh, that you know, a new large chunk of the city needs to deal with uh, sustainability in a very meaningful way. We worked with Guy Battle uh, to come up with our strategy, and one of the most important things was retaining rainwater runoff rather than sending it out into the rivers. Uh, so there was a large system that sat down at the, uh, down below grade. Absorbing the water on the top, using that actually to irrigate the gardens as the water comes down, so it was, it was somewhat filtered by the time uh, you were going to retain it in the system. And then, can you integrate other technologies, wind turbines, photovoltaics in the skin, so the building actually has the ability to generate power rather than just use it? And is there a way that you can, you can get these? Buildings, not just to harness the wind to drive the wind turbines, uh, but to, to direct the wind in, in a, away from the ground level. One of the real problems of the Trade Center site always was that it was extremely windy. You go to visit the Trade Center, it was acting as a sail and driving this wind down to the ground level. Uh, by, by creating these gardens uh, in the sky uh, that have the ability to, to let the wind through them, what, what we found in, in subject to you know, a wind tunnel test was that you, that you can mitigate the winds at ground level. So, you know, in other words, when it hits the building, it gets directed horizontally through the building, so you don't get as, as strong a wind coming down to ground level, so sort of this shoot down the face of the building. And this is a diagram of how those winds will find their way through the site. And, and this was a, sort of a diagram of what we got after around with these shapes. And we started to discover what you can do with the shapes. Now, it, one thought is, you know, conventional wisdom is that you can tell developers how to, how to limit their impact on the street level environment. So you create a series of setbacks like New York City zoning does, or you cap off height, or you cap the amount of development. Just assuming that what a developer is going to do is, is by definition bad for a city, uh, and nobody really tries to explore, you know, can, you, can you shape the environment by uh, doing something less conventional with the building? So one thought was that you could, you could shape these buildings so that you direct the views where you want them to. So these views, currently, views get blocked by, um, uh, by World Financial Center as you look across Manhattan. And they were, these buildings were positioned along the street so you deliberately were actually blocking the views. So we thought maybe you could block your view to, World Financial Center to see the see through the sky. Or you can frame these buildings that, that you thought were worth framing, like the Woolworth building here. And uh, so we came up with a composition of buildings that starts to fill up the site. Now the idea was that it would take a long time for development to really catch up with downtown. So you wanted a project that felt complete and something you could visit uh, right away. It's as possible. So we proposed a sort of film of water that went over the original footprint, uh, footprints of the towers. Uh, so this was sort of the sacred space that's on, on, the, on the west, and the development would happen on the east right on top of this rail station where the development wants to be. And then over time, uh, these buildings would start to fill out the site. But the buildings were interconnected, so that you get a series of experiences that are public that are up within the section of these towers. Here, how the, how the site starts to fill up. Now, none of the buildings actually would sit on the footprints of the original towers, but they would sort of do a dance around them. Uh, but the idea was that it would take a long time before the demand really required that the whole site got filled up. And you see here how the, these public spaces come along with the development. So that as soon as you take away public space and grade, you reinstate the public space in the sky. Uh, and so, so as you look at it from above, ultimately all of the ground plane reappears as green space uh, on the tops of the building. And this would give you 16 acres of public park rather than just setting aside 
at least right now, uh, seven acres out of the 13. Uh, but you actually do more to get the public space up in the sky. We, we were proposing 16 acres of civic space as well, so you could create a series of tours of, of the sort of trade center site, a little bit like the Vatican Museum. You've got half an hour, you can do this tour. If you have longer, you can create a longer tour. Uh, and in this way, rather than having just the, the space in the sky be private space, and one of the weaknesses of, of the way we develop cities now is that we create space that you either got to, you have to pay to go to visit, like the, the sky deck at, um, at the, uh, well, at the Hancock Building, Sears Tower, or space that you need to, you need to lease to enjoy. The idea is that you know, perhaps in the future, and a little bit like the, that, that building in Singapore, these public spaces would exist up in the section of the building, so everyone can experience sort of the, the excitement of being high up in a building uh, in the city. So that was, that was the thought behind this. And you get a sense a little bit from some of these rendered views what it might be like uh, as you move up in the buildings to be able to look out uh, from these uh, viewpoints that are usually kind of the, the, the space of the, of the CEO or the, or the privileged um, executive. Uh, lots of more of these showing us the spaces between the towers. One of the things that I think was difficult about the model that we created was that you, you want to see it up, up close to understand uh, how these spaces between the buildings are formed. One of the things that I thought was very interesting for everyone working on this the team was that you start to understand a tall building rather, rather as, a, as something that shapes space and creates creates the spaces between the buildings that are as powerful as the as, as the building itself. And they're not icons in the conventional sense, uh, but they really are enormously scaled uh, urban spaces. And these are just some musical model. These are the skyline views, which are not exactly the guy kind of everybody's looking for, but you get a sense of the sort of it's just a chunk of space. It's a super dense uh, piece of Manhattan, uh, but has a public aspect to it. This is the view from the, uh, from the uh, east. So, I mean, that wasn't the end of our involvement, obviously. Probably a more popular piece. And I think some of the lessons that we learned there, we tried to put to work uh, in this project that's now under construction in London. Uh, this is all residential, well, for the most part, residential. There's some uh, office space, and uh, there's a performing arts center within the, within the proposal. But this is on a tribu uh, tributary of the Thames. You see the Thames, the bend of the Thames at the top of the image with the Millennium Dome in it. Just to the right, of where you see the dome is, uh, is where Canary Wharf is, which is the big sort of uh, big reservoir of, uh, of corporate office space, and which is driving these residential projects that are in the Lower Lee Valley. Uh, now, now suddenly Canary Wharf is successful. Uh, and people need the people are interested in having a place to live that's that's convenient to it. Our site is actually a cooking oil factory right now. It's, 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 this cooking oil factory has been demolished and they're beginning uh, site work. Called the Lee River. Uh, what you see in the bottom of the image is uh, is, uh, is a large uh, transportation hub, a Jubilee Line, Docklands Light Rail Line uh, comes through there, as well as a bus, uh, as well as a large bus station. So this is a link to Canning Town and to London proper. So it's, it's, it's very well served by public transportation. As soon as you get across the river, uh, which I'll show you how we propose to do that, and you can see here. Uh, what the development would look like. So this is about uh, three, about three million square feet of residential space. It's a, it's a large residential community, uh, but it's a pedestrian-only environment. So this is a large residential community that doesn't have sort of traffic running through it. And you can see here the section. There's a big reservoir of parking that sits below. There's this bridge that goes across the, the Lee River. You can see on the left side, but the, we've tapered this parking level down so you can walk from the bridge down the slope uh, into the adjacent community. So it has a very smooth trans transition into the city fabric uh, that's adjacent to it, but just being a peninsula. 
uh, we line this parking garage on either side uh, with the residential space. You never see the garage. Uh, this is a view from above. We work with Martin Schwartz, the landscape architect, to uh, create a, a series of parks and gardens uh, that play off its forms, but also tear us down so that there's, a, there's an ambiguity between what is architecture and what is landscape when you're inside the space. We try to use this idea of strata, uh, this, this sort of peninsula being formed by the river uh, and the banks of the river inspired us to, to, to use this as a way of uh, unifying the composition of buildings uh, that might actually get executed by other architects. We were just trying to establish standards that where you took these lines, these horizontal water lines, uh, and allowed that to link, link the towers and uh, buildings visually. But these, but they, these strata can be made out of different materials. It's very this stone and metal. Uh, and this review showing the strata once again, unifying the composition. And then some studies of the models. And this is just meant to show that, uh, I mean, typically, you know, when we present these things, you see a plan, and you see some finished renderings. A lot of our process is, uh, is in these study models. Uh, just, just testing out uh, whether our idea of a material palette or configuration is going to work. So this is a large scale uh, model that's made out of plaster. And this is a this fairly large scale model that's made out of wood. We're trying to show how we can create variety uh, using the idea of the strata, some stone strata stacked up. Another view of the study. So here's a rendered view. Uh, based on some of those ideas, this strata taking you through, this public space that weaves through the project, and this idea that you shape the public space with buildings on either side that begin to merge with the landscape. One of the main spaces was a, a big public space. At the top, we used a, an approach similar to what I was showing at the Mill Center for the Arts, uh, where we used a series of cables suspended over the space to hang out. Temporary enclosure. So you had the render view, and then this is view of what it might look like. So you could stretch a fabric between these cables that are held up by the buildings uh, so that you have multi use uh, public space that, that you can use even when it's raining, which is often obviously not. So, top of the bridge. So, so we worked with a, a local artist slash architect slash engineer, Thomas Heatherway, uh, to do the design for this bridge. And uh, the original design for the bridge had a, a couple of pylons and this Calatrava-esque uh, cable, cable state bridge. Heatherway said, well, why don't you just hang it off the building? So his idea was to use the stainless steel bands suspended from the building and pulled up the bridge. So the buildings actually act as a kind of a support structure for it. Uh, we're still trying to get this idea Client on board with this idea is to challenge some of their ideas, their, their notions of ownership. Uh, but we think it would be worth it to, to imagine walking across this bridge with this colossal river that's coming down to the right. Uh, so that project is now uh, underway with planning approval finally after about three and a half years. And uh, this is the last topic, and, and, and uh, one of the things that we're spending a lot of our time on right now is this, this uh, Olympic. Uh, bid plan for the city of Chicago. We've been involved with uh, the city to create a kind of a venue plan, figure out where these venues should go in order to make the Olympics work well for the city of Chicago, uh, as, as well as you know, in order to, to win the bid. So the, as you can see from, from this uh, image, almost all the venues are right within the city of Chicago, in the center of the city. There, there aren't too many events that are in outlying areas, which allows uh, allows the thing to to, uh, to be very compact. Very compact. The, the bulk of them are centered right around the, the center of the city, uh, uh, using you know, Soldier Field and uh, McCormick Place for a number of venues, as well as uh, sites that are along the waterfront. We're currently working on. Uh, the idea for Olympic Village would be on the marching yards uh, that are just south of the Marine Place. The idea is that the, the city, because it owns uh, that.
that property could build an Olympic Village to house all of the athletes uh, that would ultimately uh, be an amenity to the neighborhood, uh, the, the neighborhood that exists, and allow people in the neighborhood to move uh, from uh, from the west across the site to the lakefront. Because right now, the, the uh, all of this sort of old infrastructure cuts off the whole neighborhood from the lakefront. Uh, from the lakefront. Uh, so these diagrams show where the Olympic Village would lie, what some of the connections would be, uh, and how a series of temporary, what they call temporary venues, which are support space for the uh, for the athletes' village, uh, which would sit actually in the parkland on the water. And that was one of the early views, and this is still uh, being refined and uh, put to the test of uh, a bunch of economists to make sure. That this is all going to work. Uh, that's a view of what it might look like in the city. Uh, but what we've been trying to push uh, uh, fairly recently is an idea that uh, you drive this whole district uh, with a, a more substantial, sustainable strategy. And uh, this would in particular be uh, to use the, the water from the lake to drive a physical plant where you use the te temperature differential between the lake water and the air to actually create district cooling or district heating, uh, which is a great amenity and allows, allows us not to use uh, fossil fuels to, to, um, uh, to serve this part of the city. And if you, if you have a large enough area, uh, you can make it worthwhile to run these, uh, run these pipes out into the lake. Uh, that's one possibility. Also, uh, geothermal wells uh, within, the, within the site uh, would allow you to, uh, to take advantage of this sort of large area of the site as well. I don't want to go through in detail all of these uh, propositions, but the, the goal is actually to, to make this Olympics and this Olympic village and the legacy of the village uh, uh, be a piece of infrastructure that contributes to the city uh, in a different way than, uh, than these kind of developments have been in the past. And uh, even the, the elements of the village, and this was an early concept for well, how does an individual building work? Can you make the individual buildings? Can you create a spec, let's say, a specification for the buildings uh, that forces the developer that ultimately can build them uh, to take on some things they might not normally do? Green roofs, photovoltaics uh, on the south or, or east and west faces, uh, overhangs on the south face that allows you to, uh, to shield against uh, uh, the low sun. And uh, we have an idea of what interlocking units a little bit like uh, Corpus Unite that allow the units to both face north and south so everyone gets uh, some south facing daylight. And this idea of uh, an amenity space, something like that project uh, I was shown in Singapore in, uh, in a trade center master plan uh, where you have amenities that are up in the section of the building that would work well for the athletes as a gathering place and then ultimately for uh, future residents. This is just a view of what that might look like. This is just speculative right now, but the, the goal, I mean, it's, we're trying to establish what sort of goals are you going to have for a residential development that is, that is built for 2016? And how do you push everyone to understand that, uh, that we need to be more ambitious about it uh, than we are today? Uh, and this is a great place to do it. The village, the last image is of a tower, we, we may have towers that become that are part of this village as well. And uh, are there ways that you get a tower uh, that responds in a different way uh, to the uh, to this lakefront site and to the environment? Uh, and we actually, for this tower, we're looking at a, uh, using a parametric model and morphing the tower in response to views uh, in a way not too dissimilar to the, uh, the tower in Dubai, but we're trying to. Use create a more specific review calculator program that allows you to modify the form of the building uh, in a unique way. So well, that was the last of the experiments. So if anyone has any has any questions, comments, fire away.
Uh, they're, they're automatic. <coughs> Excuse me. They're automatic, and there there are six sensors right now on the roof, and the sensors uh, are, are will uh, they can sense whether you have a cloudy sky or whether you have a, a bright sun in the sky, and they, and they needed six of them actually because they were afraid. You had a small cloud that came over. You had part of the louvers going down, and part of them coming up. And they didn't want them responding too quickly. So you had these louvers flapping if you had small clouds come over. So they, they, they required six of them to kind of see, get a big picture, so get the big picture of the whole sky. But it's all done automatically, uh, and they all and the default is down, so that when you get a rainstorm, they're all down, and at night they're all down. And I I just want to go visit it so I can see. And we'll stand up on the roof and see what happens when the sun comes up and these louvers are sort of uh, opening. Uh, and one of the things that I forgot to mention is that the, the, these louvers are actually have a mirror finish on them, so that when the sun comes up, they open up right away so that you can bounce more daylight. So the sun is at a very low angle, there's not that much coming through the skylight, uh, but we're able to get it to work so that these, uh, these louvers bounce daylight. Additional daylight down early in the day, so they open up right away when the sun comes up. If anybody has questions about the China Energy, you can ask Paul. Well, I'm sure everybody's hot. Expectation of the building is 
uh, has to go beyond simply uh, sort of a straightforward shed. And, then, and you can see that, but I think the reason why I was calling these experiments was that we're not quite sure where it's going to shake out. And sometimes you can, you can see these things become more prosaic because the client or the budget or something is driving uh, decisions to your decisions that you come up with something that's less ambitious than what you wanted. And then sometimes you, know, you can get away with something that, that is more exciting. And, and I think the key is actually to understand what you were successful and try to try to use that strategy on the it's a, it's a work in progress as to, as to how do you respond to this tradition and, and, and not to belabor the answer too much, but I think that one of the challenges that's a little bit different from working in a firm like, uh, like Skidmore is that you're not so much at liberty uh, to come up with your own sort of personal expression of what you think the building should be, which is true in you know, Doug's practice, for instance, that you know, you know, Doug Groffle, I'm going to do uh, going to do something that's about you know, the way I want this building to be, or, or again, in his case, you know, it's, it's, it's an expression of the, the client's interest in the budget, but also, I mean, it can be Doug's personality, I think it's an interesting challenge, but also a benefit to a certain degree of being at Asylum is, is to try to create something that fits within this legacy of work, that, you know, can you do a building that, that somebody is going to talk about? Uh, when they're talking about the impact, well, I guess it's building on this legacy of the firm rather than a kind of a, a personal expression. And that's, you know, that's also important. Thanks. I'm glad that Bob's question inspired it. Yeah, I know the question has to do with your answer, not your answer. There is this legacy of work, but the question is how critical has the firm been? Actually, if you, if, and, and, and they said, you know, I went, I went to school in the 70s, I was an architect for 
the 70s through the 80s, and actually at Yale, we were taught that, that SOM was like sort of a great evil, and yet it walked by the Carnegie Library, and that was awful, and you know, Vincent's going, you know, quite straightforward about saying, you know, this is, this is a scourge, and that was when everybody was, was doing correspondence on it. So what's, what's happened internally is actually people have come back to the understanding that there was great value in, the, in these earlier projects, and we're trying to save some of them, or, or many of them, but I, but I think in terms of trying to assess what worked and what didn't, it's not really happening. And I don't think all of the partners are necessarily uh, doing what I was describing as, as sort of trying to, trying to build on this tradition or make sure that what you contribute to the firm uh, is can be read within that tradition. I, you know, I don't think there's a consensus that that is even the right approach because many partners want to make a name for themselves that has to do with a, a particular style or look to a building, but one of the things that I think will happen is that you know, in the future as, as people look back on the buildings, they'll try to sort of create a thread uh, that links together uh, projects that are innovative in, in, a, in kind of a thorough way. And I think the more interesting earlier projects are the ones that are innovative, and in spite of the fact that I was taught to hate my Nikki, I mean there's something that's really interesting about the idea of building, doing a library for books that protects them kind of uh, very thin stones that you're going to have this dialogue with the old, with the old parts of the campus and the stone building which you've got this kind of magic that you can find inside. But I don't know, I think that there was, one of the things I didn't explain that well is that the difference in the Chicago office is that we have engineers in the house. And I think that a lot of these experiments that I've been talking about were done hand in hand with the engineers. So the engineers input uh, can be as important as anybody uh, from the design group or from the technical group. So that if you're sitting with a structural engineer and a mechanical engineer in the first week of the project, it affects, I think, the, the tools that you can use. And you're not just sort of pulling out that last thing you did with the pattern facade or whatever. You, you're able to kind of look at it fresh. And I think that's, that, yeah, that's an interesting aspect of the technique that's going to allow us to do something different. I just want to suggest that adopting Cities and projects that no one else can. 
no matter how like, visually important or successful the train theory may be, is only influential on a very narrow field. Right? Whereas your field is enormously wider, just on the scale of the planning department does the entire kingdom of brains and planning you know, things that are just beyond the scope. So how, like, if design is, say, one aspect of the project that so, what would be its order of the project? And how would it kind of address its own strategy towards moving forward beyond just continuing to be able to do this? Okay, I think that's a good question. And it's, it's interesting because um, it, it, for me, it, it echoes a little bit what Bruce Mao was saying. And, and uh, we had uh, Bruce Mao redesign our website. Uh, and the website that we have right now uh, is completely different than the website we had two, two years ago. And what was very interesting is that when we went to, to Bruce and we said, listen, we want to rethink the way we look to the world. And, and he said, well, you know, I'm going to have to take a couple of months here and research who you are and really understand who you are, what is this firm, and what do you do? And uh, I thought it was kind of, it was great as an approach as opposed to saying, okay, here, here's what I do and here's your answer. He said, we've got, to, we've got to think about this. We've got to think about who's going to go on your website and why. And how is your firm perceived by people around the world? And I think it was, it was very interesting because we were getting kind of a reflection back I mean, from his, his point of view, which is really about how do people innovate, how do people do things that are new around the world. What he came back with was a little bit like what you're saying, Paul, is that there is a, a, a political, social aspect to what you do because there's so much of it. And you've got to get it all out there. So his answer was, take everything you do and make it available to everybody. And let people know that this is what you know, the breadth of the practice is. Um, and, and get that word out there. Because you could, you could take five or six projects and show them in an exquisite way. And it would just look just as exquisite as Benjamin Burkle, who you know, has this fairly small, innovative office. But, you know, that doesn't make any sense. You're not taking advantage of the fact that you've got a thousand people that are working worldwide and there is really a political impact to what you do. And actually, what was very interesting is so that we proposed this partnership. And the partnership didn't necessarily see that as a positive thing. And they wanted the, you know, the, the, uh, they wanted the impression of you know, that five-person office in Amsterdam uh, doing innovative stuff. And they wanted to control the message. So it was just you know, this, this sort of most exquisite projects, or whatever that might be. And I think that, um, I think what the partnership was challenged by was the fact that if you do have an operation that ultimately is political, that is global, that you have to be innovative. You have to, every single thing that you do has to be innovative. It has to, you know, if you're going to do the Kingdom of Bahrain, you've got to bring the best minds to bear on it, and it's got to be something different it's got to be something new. Otherwise, you haven't contributed anything at all. All you've done is sort of expand the status quo. And that's one of the, actually internally, one of the most difficult things now at SLM is trying to push anybody, everybody to be innovative. You do a train station, you do a doorknob, if you do a street light, that there has to be an aspect of it that is innovative. And what's challenging about that is that that's not necessarily the best path to profit. And that, you know, if you're, if you're recycling something out of the drawer, you're going to make a lot more money on that project. And you know, reinterpreting something you did before can be very possible.